Welcome, everyone, and thank you for coming to today's presentation. Um, a special thanks to Ambassador Atkenbayer and the Embassy of Mongolia and all of the conference organizers for bringing the conference to us again this year. Uh, I'm Susan Meinheit. I'm the Tibetan and Mongolian Reference Specialist in the Library's Asian Division. Uh, and please note that we have refreshments in the back of the room, light refreshments, uh, which you're welcome to enjoy uh, throughout the sessions. Please feel free to get up and get something to drink or eat as, as we're proceeding. Uh, and it is now my pleasure to introduce to you the Asian Division Chief, Dr. Dongfeng Shao. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Library Congress. And Asian Division is pleased to host the keynote speaker, a keynote speak talk for the 14th Annual International Mongolia Study Conference again this year. It is the fifth year for this ongoing tradition. And we are grateful to the His Excellency Yongdong Autogon Bayar Ambassador of Mongolia and the Mongolia Culture Center and its president, Suru Eden McMeer, and William Fitzhugh, director of Arctic Study Center, National Museum of Natural History, Smithsonian, and Mongolia National University of Arts and Culture for bringing the conference participant to the Library of Congress. Asian Division is a custodial division with library Asian language collections. We have about 4.7 million physical items in over 190 Asian languages. And we provide reference services and public outreach for each of our collections in Asian reading room. The Mongolia collection is one of the largest in North America. And after the meeting, we will have uh, prepared a display for you to browse in reading room many newly acquired Mongolian items. Yeah. We invite all of you to enjoy today's presentations to make use of our co collection for your future research needs. Yeah. And now it's my pleasure to invite Ambassador Anto Gombayer to offer a welcome Remarks. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And first of all, I would like to thank Library of Congress for this wonderful opportunity that uh, they usually offer to our conference annually. Me personally, second time in this beautiful room to give uh, some remarks. When I'm saying remarks, uh, I should explain to you why I'm saying remarks. Because I was asked yesterday by Susan uh, to say a few words about the Mongolian long song. I was a little bit disturbed because I found out that I'm going to speak before three presentations of professionals. So what I'm going to deliver you guys about long song that professionals would not deliver to you. That was a little bit hesitation with me. But after some thought, I thought that uh, I should share with you my own experience with Mongolian long song and my own, uh, what you say, my own feeling and what, I've, uh, what I know about this. Of course, most, um, all Mongolians are well aware of long song. Though not everybody can sing, only good singers can sing long song. I can see one of the renowned singers today, probably you will hear a uh, long song from him. Uh, important events such as Nadam celebration, weddings, inauguration of new house, uh, birth of the baby, uh, branding of the foals, are usually accompanied with a symbolic long song. 
for example, Nadam usually starts with Ishtni Sahan, that's a state long state song of the Great Mongol Empire, or believed to be state song of Great Mongol Empire. I personally do not believe that if Chinggis Khan was alive, he would allow uh, uh, he would allow to praise him in a state song. Probably that song uh, was born much later. Or Nadam starts with Tumungich, that's the first among the myriads, that's about racehorse. Weddings, well, to my knowledge, usually starts with Uyghan Zambativi Narang, that's Sun Over the Beautiful Universe, beautiful song. Uh, to my uh, opinion, just uh, representing peaceful life of uh, newlyweds. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I would say that many Mongolians, uh, although they are well aware of Long Song, uh, they're uh, paying probably very uh, low attention to the lyrics. Because in some point, maybe five minute song may contain 10 words. It's uh, not easy to uh, listen to that and understand what's going on. And uh, I noticed that in, in most cases, uh, lyrics are not strict, strictly rhymed. Usually, sometimes it contains a very religious, very philosophical text, uh, and, uh, which might put you in meditation type of thing. Uh, I love good Shurankhais. Shurankhai, well, I had to. Uh, look into dictionary how to, uh, what Shorunhai would mean in English. Uh, it turns out that it's uh, prolonged tenuta notes with deeply modulated vibrato on the vowels. I think musicians would understand. Uh, so, but uh, not everybody is aware that uh, these songs are for different occasions. There might be long songs about everyday life. Uh, there might be songs uh, uh, about religious texts. It's called Kur, or Kur of Tindu. That's a Kur long song that uh, usually contains a religious text. Uh, and uh, some songs are about taboos. Uh, it's uh, called Tsering Tindu, or song, long songs about the taboos. I don't think that everybody knows that the very popular long songs in Mongolia, such as Hurun Tolgan Shudr, that's uh, in translation would mean Shadow of the Brown Hill, or Irtin Zaskin Unuk, a foul of Irtin Zaskin Hushun, are actually songs about taboos. Uh, people believe that Art of the Long Song was born about 2,000 years ago. I believe that it should have even longer history. Uh, but at least a written account of the existence of a uh, long song is 2,000 years old when Chinese ambassador to Hunlu Emperor uh, in his note, travel notes has written that uh, Huns were singing like wolves were holy. So it was probably a reference to a long song. So inherited from these uh, times, long song became of the feature of the Mongolian tribes. Uh, I believe that it's not only in Mongolia, it's all Mongolian tribes across the great steppe. Uh, and nowadays you can hear the specific long songs belonging to the different nationalities among the Mongols. Uh, for example, Barguts in Hulumbur in China, they, they do have their own specific long songs, or Chakars in Shilingol, and Hushuts or as we call them, dead Mongols in uh, Gansu province. Very characteristic long songs can be heard from uh, Halkhaz. In Halkhaz, you will find out the variations like Portuguese songs or uh, Shilimbok songs, uh, these variations. Uh, and the Western Mongolians also, they do have their own uh, version of the long songs. Uh, for example, Torguts in Xinjiang and Long Song of the Kalmyks in Caspian Sea are a little different 
from each other and quite different from uh, the long songs that we have in Mongolia. Mongolia registered long song as a masterpiece of oral intangible cultural heritage of humanity in 2005. And in 2008, when I was a minister of education, culture and science of Mongolia, we, registered, we inscribed long song in the UNESCO representative list of intangible cultural heritage. I was talking to the gentleman about the Homi, uh, registration of Homi and uh, scandals related with that. Believe me, in 2008, there was less politicization about UNESCO list, and uh, we inscribed uh, Long Song together with China in 2008. And there was a, a joint project of Mongolian and Chinese government, which, were, which lasted, I think, almost four years, and we have been able to revive uh, and reinvigorate about 160 long songs in Mongolia and Inner Mongolia, which was uh, almost forgotten. The reason why I'm uh, uh, saying, well, it's no coincidence that the government of Mongolia pays so much attention to the long song as a cultural heritage, registering it in, uh, with UNESCO, uh, government of Mongolia does have a special government program on Long Song to revive this age old tradition. And, uh, you know, in the morning we have heard about uh, the, the paper about desertification and uh, uh, climate change. I would add that the uh, process of urbanization and industrialization also superseded traditional nomadic lifestyle in the Mongolian steppes. And uh, many move to the cities, uh, well, eventually losing traditional practices and expressions. And also because of the climate change and desertification uh, and loss of the grassland, also a lot of families shift to the sedentary way of life. Gradually, we, face, we may face a danger that many classical themes, such as long song, uh, may lose their relevance in contemporary life. Uh, to me, long song, it's a, a praise of nomads' virtues and experience, and uh, praise of uh, expression of the soul of nomads. And uh, in case if we lose that uh, practice or that uh, cultural heritage, uh, we are losing one identity of Mong Mongol being a Mongol. So that's why a lot of work is being done under the government program, by central ministries, by local governments, and most importantly by enthusiasts in different parts of Mongolia to keep intact this uh, piece of oral intangible tradition of Mongolians. And uh, I'm sure that uh, people, uh, people of Mongolia, government of Mongolia, and especially art and cultural researchers, art lovers, uh, would do a lot of things in the future to preserve this very characteristically Mongolian art. So let's hope that Long Song, as an ode to the soul of the nomad, will live for centuries ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Ambassador Atkan Bayer. That was beautiful. Um, we uh, are now going to begin our main uh, keynote talk. Uh, the, the subject, uh, the title, as you can see, is The Art of Sounding, Techniques, Terminologies, and Be Meanings of Mongolian Long Song. And we have three scholars who will approach the topic from three different perspectives. An ethnomusicologist, a long song singer, and a linguist. Um, I'd like you all three to come and sit uh, on the stage, if you could. So, 
So our ethnomusicologist is Sun Moon Yoon. Uh, she is adjunct assistant professor of world music at the University of Delaware, Newark. She is an ethnomusicologist specializing in Mongolian folk songs, and her research focuses on the intersection of the genre's preservation and globalized cultural heritage. She has a PhD in ethnomusicology from University of Maryland College Park, an MA in ethnomusicology from Kent State University, and an MA in musicology from Kim Yon University in South Korea. Mr. Batfold is a long song singer on the faculty of the School of Music Arts, Mongolian National University of Art and Culture, Ulaanbaatar. He teaches long song technique and is head of the Mongolian Long Song Association. In addition, he is a Mongolian wrestling coach and a Mongolian wrestling title singer. He received the title of Honored Artist of Mongolia from the government of Mongolia. Welcome, Mr. Beffold. Sarol Ardin Mikmar needs no introduction. He is a librarian, a Mongolian specialist here at the Library of Congress in the Asian and Middle Eastern Division. He has previously been a Mongolian language instructor at the Foreign Service Institute, U.S. Department of State, visiting scholar at Indiana University, and lecturer at the Mongolian State University of Education. He has a Ph.D. in linguistics from Mongolian State Pedagogical University in Ulaanbaatar. So please welcome our speakers today. Thank you, Susan, for a um, wonderful introduction. Wow, we have a lot of audience <laughs> today. Um, I'm an ethnomusicologist. I actually studied Ontindo um, past almost 10 years um, in and out, and meeting a lot of singers. I'm not a Mongolian, I'm not an American, but um, I was really drawn into this sound of long song when I get to Mongolia very first time. And anyone who hear the sound of song is never gonna forget the sound. And I decided back in 2006, why? What, what element of this music that has been survived for a long time in Mongolia, what aspect of this really make people remember this song? So that was only my question to go into Mongolia. So um, I've been questioning myself, I've been questioning a lot of singers, and I'm still in searching. But in the process of the searching, I found the way of that they're making the sound out of their lyrics is the one of the art of this genre. And that way of making the sound really stands out this genre in there. Um, our ambassador, Yundung, talked about everything about Ortindo. So I don't think we really need a lot of introduction. <laughs> but um, so people often um, talk about what is Ortindo? Um, it has been researched for several other scholars, and there are a couple of literature about it. And one of the research from uh, Japan talked about, you know, what is Ortindo. And he talked about really these melismatic elements, which is really the ornaments really makes really special of this genre. And how they make these ornaments is really kind of expanding and, you know, sometimes con contracting of this, this, um, the lyrics and vowels and consonants in the lyric, lyrics and in a free rhythm. If you are, you are not a really music person, you might wonder what is free rhythm? Maybe there is no rhythm. Um, there is a certain way of filling the lyrics and phrase, musical phrase, and we call it rhythm. We always really used to, in the Western world, we're used to 
counting what it is, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Sometimes we call it irregular. But in Mongolia, everything is free. So they put this sound on very free spirit and free sound. So we often call it free rhythm. It doesn't mean that really there isn't any rhythm, but there is, but it's very free. So they put this sound on rhythm and then drawing the sound as they want to make. So this kind of thing really requires tremendous training. I'm not a practitioner. We have a tremendous great um, singer in here. We're going to listen to it. But it really requires a lot of um, training. But the training isn't really coming from the conservatory. It's really coming from the way of life that they're living together with the livestock, listening to the livestock, listening to the wind, listening to the landscape. And then they make the melodic line out of that environment. So with that training, with that background, and training from their elders, learning from what really Mongols customs are, they learn these long songs. So with um, those background, uh, one of the one of the scholar named Tedro Levin, um, who is actually Tuvan scholar, music scholar, talked about this long song as People often listen this as um, melodic music. But uh, it is melodic. Uh, you're going to listen to that. And it is melodic. But in melodic line, you're kind of changing, manipulating something different. The word is something different. That's timbre. We call it in music. Timbre, tone quality. So you change oh, ah. But oh, ah sounds different. So they change this timbre. So it's not just melodic, but within the melodic line, they change this timbre. And that really brought by this leaven. Um, and I fully agree. And it's right there. And that's what really makes really long song special as well. Um, but he, he talked about the background, but the content, it's really hard to understand what they're singing, even if you're Mongolians. Um, it's really hard to understand because it's elongated and sometimes the word itself is really kind of old word too, right? So it's not easy, but the, in terms of content, they're talking about, you know, religious and philosophical and also kind of ceremonial and um, sometimes talking about loved one. You know, one of the songs I think he's going to show today is um, one of the songs that song always right after wedding, you go outside and then say, you're gonna move away. They don't know, they are nomads. They don't know when they're gonna meet again, right? So they're saying like, you know, the foreign land is gonna be really, really hard. So just wait and just take time and just live with it, right? And then they just sing that as a long song. So those are the contents of the long songs. And they're imitating animals and they're talking about their first place. So that's pretty much in long song. So um, what we're going to do today, I'm not going to talk about as a really keynote speaker. Uh, we have three people. And I'm still in the part of learning what these long song techniques are. And we're going to work together today, not as really just what it is defining, but we're going to talk together and trying to figure out what it is from linguist and from practitioner and from me as a music scholar that about these techniques um, that has been always in, in Mongolia long song today. So we have several terms that we're gonna go through, but before that, we're gonna actually listen to the long song because we have to know what it is in terms of sound, right? So we'll have uh, Mr. Papurt coming in and singing.
Okay, so that was Ortindo, and now we'll talk about these ornaments and techniques. It's very interesting from both from the linguistic side and from musical side, and uh, we were very happy to work together. And he was in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. She was in Delhi, where I was here, and then uh, it was like a in very interesting project from three places we are talking, okay? <laughs> and, uh, let's do this, then that, that, and uh, So for example, very first one, Bunjigun, Bunjigunuk. It's very interesting word in the uh, Mongolian language. See, it's, uh, uh, in the civil dictionary, it says the movement of a small round item. And then the Bolotel says it's for something round to shake or sway. It's very difficult to translate as a one word this word, bunjgnuk. Should be small, also round, and also moving very quickly. So all the, uh, the uh, vowels and uh, consonants here has the meaning. For example, there is so many such a uh, roots in the Mongolian language, like punj, bund, or bond, or band. So the difference between punj, bond, bund, bond, band, is all b in there makes it round, then how round, a small round or big round, that the vowel makes it. So punj is always the smallest one, bond, or a little bit bigger, and then band, making it much as bigger. So. So bunjigunuk is the small one. And then the, those uh, suffixes are different too. Bunji, this a, e, that uh, suffix makes it move, but it's very slowly, or being still, bunji. This small round thing is being still, or if it moves, slowly, bonda, or banda. Uh, it moves or being still. Kana gine guno, that suffix makes it, them move very quickly. Bunjigun, quickly, bondun. Even bandhan cooker, cooker. And then kar gur, gir gur, those uh, suffix makes it uh, an adjective. So bunjgur is adjective, bunjgur something, and bandhur something, and bandhur something. Those kind of words is very difficult to translate to English because it's a uh, difference is just, uh, oh, how big is it? Oh, so. So what is in uh, music, bunjgur, that? <laughs> well, basically it's a trill. Um, anyone knows trill, uh, with two pitches, you're kind of alternating, ah, 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 ah. but um, it's a uh, trill, it's trill in Western music. But in Mongolian, these ornaments, trill, there are two different kinds, uh, three different kinds, four different kinds, but main difference uh, between bundigunuk and chukhok, which is in, gonna be in the next slide, is how you use your larynger part. So bunjugnuk is much more softer, so ah, 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 I'm not a singer. Ah, ah, ah. But bunjugnuk would be like striking your vocal cord. And we're gonna have an example from uh, Mr. Bakort. So bunjugnuk. <laughs> <laughs> In relation to that bonjugnuk that you just saw, is chokfok is um, a little bit harsher, uh, but you know there is no equivalent term in Western music. So, but yes, can we see chesni is using? So depending on what kind of body parts you use, it has different names too. It's, yeah, chesni chokfok. Chesni is like your chest, so you're using actually sound coming out of your chest and using this trill. Sounds really difficult, it is difficult. Yes. You can hear the, the pitch is going down and the timbre goes much deeper. That becomes just Okay, next technique is both or kolsakh, those two are uh, similar. And both, kolsakh, both are very common word in the Mongolian language. So most uh, musical terminologies, uh, uh, or tindo terminologies are, they're using like everyday word and using it in the musical background. So this thing says both is to come or go down fall, to descend. Civil says the boch is the to move downward, ornas boch. 
to go down from the top. And then Kosakh is dissimilar, Kotkach and Kosakh is dissimilar, to glide, slide, skate, but still Kosakh in much, many meanings, not only just uh, horizontally, it's vertically Kosakh, Kosakh is coming down. So both of these uh, words, common ideas from top to down. So what is in the music, it's uh, so yeah, I was having a hard, hard time to find the right word for these things. But bolt and book is like, so it's a contour. We call it contour. The way of shaping of the melodic line is contour. And this contour, descending contour, instead of going up, it's overall the melodic line is going down, is bolt. And in contrast, gulsah would be like a very uh, simple read also have it in Western art music, like uh, glissando, like, oh, oh, that is pretty much gursach. So here is the example. <laughs> two, two different of bolt, kind of. So one is just directly go down, and one is you uh, go to two different vowels, right? Is it? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. It's like a river with uh, lots of uh, stones and uh, going like this way. That, 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 oh, how the <laughs> See how that difficult is. Okay, direct one. That was direct uh, bolt. That was the one uh, he explained, uh, like uh, the current of the river, right? Going down. Okay, Okay, next one is Shorunghe. So that one, and so far, we found that uh, the only real Ortindo terminology. So other ones, most other ones, just everyday word, right? And we use it as in the musical uh, uh, background. But Shorunha is the exact terminology for only Ortindo. But there is a two different uh, uh, variations of explanation etymology. And uh, when uh, uh, Johnson, or famous uh, Mongolian composer, published that uh, this book, uh, that uh, Badra, another famous Mongolian uh, uh, scholar, interviewed uh, Ortindo Ching, uh, long song singer uh, Dorjtaug. And uh, Dorjtaug explained that, is it Shorunha or Shorunha? Still don't know. People before, when I was young, many people said it's Shorunghe. But still now, many people say it's Shorunghe. So both are possible. If it's Shorunghe with no long, long vowel, just Shorunghe, then the root it should be Shor. Shor. And that should be with, together with the same root of Shor to crawl in. So crawling in. <coughs> if it's the Shorunghe, the root must be Shor to storm or to wind. So maybe you, our audience, can decide like after Bad Paul sings, is it crawling in or creeping on, sneaking in some melody or the winding? <laughs> um, um, in music, it's basically falsetto. If you guys are, um, if you are um, familiar with the falsetto, it's like uh, falsetto really originated for the singers who are, um, for the male singers has to go up, high note, and then it's hard to make the sound, so it goes, ah, uh, really like weaker sound, so it, it, it's a high note. It's really equivalent in that sense. Yeah. Two different shorunha there. The single and the double. Okay, the single shorunha. Okay, single shorunkhai to us. Okay, now if the double double shorunkhai is when you do shorunkhai, then you shik shik, which we will we'll explain it later, next one, shik shik kind of, <laughs> and then go back another shorunkhai to back to. Okay. 
So he said, Shikshilt, if you do double shorncha, you have to go through the Shikshilt. So it's now it's the Shikshik. Shikshik is the interesting word, and lesson dictionary said to sift, bolt, to winnow, fan, grains, and then Kurdik or Kurdik in the Mong in ancient Mongolian language it was Kurdik, Kurdik Shikshiku, to flower. And then Tsil said it has two meanings. First meaning is to choose or to select, and the second meaning is to sift something with a winnowing fan. But I I think it's the first meaning should be the, to sift of something with Svino and Fan. That means the second meaning is to choose something or to select. And then it's like we do the, you know, like this, right? So this movement in uh, music, what is that? <laughs> so um, when you go up to another pitch with ah, uh, ah, uh, so ah, uh, ah, uh, when you go up, if you go directly with the dry, Sound, it's really hard to make it. So, what um, Mongolian long song singers do is like, ah, and then open up the resonance, um, this capacity, and then make a little bit of vibrato. So, ah, and then it goes up. So, that's really shikshilt. So, in that movement, it's like, ah, it, it's shaking a little bit shikshilt. Here is the shikshilt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are two different kinds of uh, two different of shikshilt. One is the the shikshik or uh, to win no in the same pitch, or the second one is from one pitch go up to another pitch. There's another shikshik. So, iklet. Okay, in the in the in the bass or in the same pitch, shikshik in the same pitch. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was the in the in the same pitch. Like uh, example was do, the not, not. going up, pitch up. <laughs> so you guess without him how we are explaining, you understand? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Nokta is another very interesting word, uh, Mongolian word. Nok, those are this another different kind of group of uh, uh, roots. And then this kind of root has some special uh, uh, pattern. If we add L, and then that makes the active verb. So, nok, nogl, to bend or to fold. It's active. Someone is bending it. It is only with L. Hogl, hok, break down something. And then the difference between nok and hok, only difference in and he. But what is the difference in meaning is nogl is in the bend, is still together. But hogl is two separate parts. Hogl. And then hagl, same to break like hogl, but it's uh, uh, the glass items. Last item. So when we're adding L, we are active. We did this. Be nogalsung, be hogalsung, be hagalsung. And then if you change a little bit, little R, then it's passive. This thing is itself nogalsung. Tritas uro nogalsung. Hogalsung. Tiru mat uro hogalsung. Itself. It's a passive. Then if you add ch, nogch, hogch, hagch, repeatedly, many times. So this repeated action that you see in the Mongolian language very uh, important, right? It, before I talked, it's bunjugnuk, the kanagunu is repeatedly. Now here too, nokchakche means like many times, many times. So this is? So it's, it's a melisma. So um, it's, um, it's another kind of ornament. Uh, instead of doing just the straightforward voice, you put it like ornament, more uh, in music after your tura. Um, it's like, oh, oh. All kinds of like this um, uh, ornaments. Here's the one. Uh, okay. So he's gonna do the shikshik and then. You know now, eh? Right? <laughs> now it is from shikshik to nogla, okay? <laughs>
Тэгэхээр So we can, he will show that we can, in Urtindu, we can intertwine or braid vowels with consonant or masculine vowels with feminine vowels. Okay. So th this is really unique, um, really only from long song, is because different from Hmi, long song has a lyrics, and this lyric has to uh, musicalize and vocalize. And this is one way how they vocalize uh, this long song. So um, I translate it as vowel weaving. So when they go, they're adding additional vowels and they're mixing with the vowels. Uh, similar concept in music, in Western art music or contemporary music, or contemporary singing, is vowel modification. So even if it's, a, it's um, vowels are different from speech vowel when we talk about singing vowel. So even if it's ah, I say ah, right? But it's not ah. It becomes sometimes ah, uh, sometimes ah, uh, sometimes ah. Uh. I made like uh, adding o sound, u sound, e sound. So depending on the pitch, if you goes up to high up, like ah, it's hard to say e sound. So you kind of open up your cup. Um, your mouth, so like, your your capacity in here, and they're becoming like it's not just e, it's a e, right? So that's kind of vowel modification in Western art music and Western contemporary singing. But it's a it's a little bit different in Mongolia long so, but adding more vowels and make more uh, kind of flexible way of flow in long song. So uh, by the way, Papolt, Mr. Papolt is uh, the expert of this. Um, okay, so he will now intertwine the vowels and singing and show you Hurkun Hajung the first time himself and second time you will all follow we will sing all together, okay? Second time. What's wrong with that? So, uh, first time you listen carefully, and then second time you follow, right? And also, it's interesting this song because in this song, the every terminology we just discussed is here, all except shorongha. So this shik shik, bunjugnuk, everything is here. Oh, 
Wow, you all have potential, very good potential. In Mongolia, in the countryside, especially in the countryside, there's big natum and big nair in the parties, and they have to sing. And then when st anyone starts like uh, this song, long song, everybody follows. So you see how it's <laughs> everybody follows, everybody can. So now you, if you go to Mongolian countryside and then someone asks what to sing, then you ask, just sing Khorkhan Gardung, I can follow you. <laughs> and you just learn, right? <laughs> Okay, next one. Uha and Hore. So, Sibyl says this is the interjection when shooting in archery or shaga. Shaga is ankle bone. And also interjection when attacking in a battle. Uha. And also interjection for expressing pleasure or agreeing. Um, musically speaking, there's not much to talk about, but what's interesting about this Oche is um, as long song practice is developed in conservatory setting and it is trained in conservatory setting, long song singers picked up this Oche as a part of um, practice for their vocals. So there is, if you go to Swiss, um, this culture uh, university or um, the music and dance college, You'll see uh, vocal practice, and as you can see from this chart, that is how long song singers developed it currently in Lombardy. This really becomes the 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 D practice among long song singers. So here is uche, that's good. This oha is kind of exercise for the beginners of learning who learn uh, ortendo long song. And also in the Oha, the everything this bunjugnuk shik shik that we talked, right? Tsakoch the tsejni, tsakoch this. Everything is uh, includes in the Oha sound.
And then they practice usually in a piano and then goes up like a different pitches. So he started, oh hey, right? And then, oh hey, oh hey, and then goes up and then practice that way. Okay, now the hore, he will show you hore for, for one time, and then after that you will follow him three times. You will hore, hore, okay? <laughs> so that is hooray, and then hooray and oha. Interestingly, we are here in the Library of Congress, so I, I, I thought that I must include this interesting uh, piece of uh, uh, history here. Not, it's not uh, here kept in the Library of Congress, but it's in the archive, National Archive, founding under the files of founding fathers. President John Adams wrote the letter to Thomas Jefferson about that one, Hore and Doha, in January 26, 1813. See, John Adams wrote, I wonder that the Hore of Genghis, Zingis, that Hore is Hore, Zingis is Genghis, of course. And then he says, Genghis, the Bonaparte of Asia has never been urged as a proof that our Indians are descended from some of his soldiers or subjects, or from some of the nations who learned the art of war from him when he scattered and drove so many of them, the Lord knows where. The Indian yell is said to be the most horrible sound that human voices can produce, and the most intimidating to an enemy. The same is said to Asiatic Hooray. Neither nations nor wild beasts could resist it. So this is here in the civil expense interjection when attacking in a battle, right? So this hooray can be in the good reason. Also, when in the hunting and also in the war, that would be like a very, very uh, strong weapon. So they were talking about this. It's very interesting. It's a, it's just as one part. And uh, actually, John Adams, even in three letters, explained about hooray. OK, next, Dave Hood. OK, so the word is, in Mongolian language, is an easy word. It's a, Galloping uh, with the horse, horse galloping. So horse galloping, how is in the music? What is that? <laughs> well, you can imagine horse galloping. So um, it starts really slow, talking about rhythm in here, and uh, going slow and then getting faster and faster. So in music, I would say uh, accelerando, you can see from the slide. Okay, so yeah. <laughs> So it's exactly the same, same uh, meaning that we are riding horse when it's just walking and then a little bit uh, uh, faster and a little bit faster. At the end, it's like galloping, right? So it's exactly the same. Okay, that's, this one is very interesting. It's animal calls. So, we are all here Mongolists and we know it's like five important animals in Mongolia, right? Sheep, goat, cow, horse, camel. Those five animals are called in Mongolian different name. That's, those five are different. So, very interesting, this uh, kind of melodies for, uh, for all of them. For sheep, it's Turk. Turk, Turk. For goat is Zozo. For cow, it's Uv, Uv. And for horse, Guri, Guri. And then for camel, Hus, Hus. And uh, Batul will now show us mm. all of them, right? Yeah. Okay. Turk. Turk. It's in the different regions of Mongolia that the melody is a little bit different. Yeah. 
That was the calling sheep or the... Toto. Toto. See, there's uh, uh, Mongolian animals are very smart listeners. And then <laughs> when he says, oh, no goat shows up, just. <laughs> and only he says, zo, zo, the goat comes up, yeah. <laughs> So now he will call horses. Hori. Hori! Hori, 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 hori! Hori! Hori, 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 hori! Okay, and camel, he's calling camel. Who's? <laughs> So um, in field, I learned, um, especially for like a camel hoose, you just learned that there are a lot of ortindo, the long song melody line attached. But for uh, sheep like a togo and zuzu, uh, it's really using for the lip practice and then for the mouth practice, in that sense. And then these really animal calls uh, was, became the basis of all those techniques you are looking at it. Uh, so people really developed from listening to the, this sound and then practice those sounds in their vocal cord and then developed those techniques. So our uh, perform, uh, artist, uh, performing artist, uh, Patot is not only just a long song singer, but he's also himself as a professor and a scholar. So here, here is the piece of uh, uh, about Kingo and Zengo, and then he explained himself about this. The children who ride race horses sing Kingo in expressing the high tones in Ortindo in the most delicate way. This Kingo is a particular melody pushed out forcefully and with a shout. The expression of the Kingo tuned with a loud voice excites the minds of animals and humans and encourage horses to gallop faster. For instance, as regards the gingo sung by children in horse races, if one looks at the tune, there are short parts of the ortindo in this gingo. You can show it. So Gingo is also different uh, depending on different kinds of regions and they have different melodic line developed and in certain area if you go it says Ummarze, a different name and then they have chant beforehand of the singing and that is related to Tibetan Buddhism. Nowadays um, you know we are having this order's protection but in old days horse race as a lot of Mongolians know in here it's very dangerous. Um, race actually, it's very fast. So all we can do as a human is um, just to pray for it, right? So before that, um, it is a song actually also to pray to as a part of Tibetan Buddhism to the one of the grim, um, the one of the tan, tandrin, tandrin, uh, one of the Tibetan deities who had this horse head. Um, to to that deity, uh, they were praying this song as a part of prayer and then went out to the horse race. Uh, so that is King. Okay. 
Finish right. So um, this is uh, pretty much uh, the terms we have. The last one, Gingo, is a usually sung by jockeys. Jockey, when we talk about jockeys, are very very young, young age. We're talking about what well, five, six years old, and that point when they sung really beautiful Gingo, and people know that person is gonna be a singer, and they were picked up by as as a singer, and they would actually invite into. Feast. As kids, you cannot really invite into feast, but because they have a really good voice, it's gonna be a great singer. And in the feast, they need a great singer, and they kind of beginning to train them. And they're gonna, you know, learn with their grandpa, grandma, and then they will become great singer. So these whole um, techniques um, sometimes it's really. Um, transable, well, trans translatable to English, but a lot of concepts are really in from the Mongolian culture, and it is really Mongolian. So as a music scholar who has completely in Western music training, had a hard time to understand to begin with and what it is, until I actually hang out with them and see how they live, how they listen to it, how they really process all those sounds, the sense are we done here? I just heard <laughs> Alarm goes off, right? So, <laughs> so until I, I, I listen to, you know, those the sensibility in the field, uh, oh, that's uh, what he means by that. That's what she means by that. So um, we are still in the process of how we explain it is. It may not be possible unless you really understand Mongolian music. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your attention. questions, and I'm sure there are many questions, so please feel free to ask uh, your questions. Um, I think we have time. And, and I have to say that uh, because the library is preparing the webcast of the program, uh, we, um, we ask that when you ask your questions, uh, you are giving your permission to be filmed and appear in a later webcast of the program. So with that caveat, please uh, ask your questions. Maybe, Arturo, can you film the questions maybe? Then we can Interesting question. That so there is a long-standing theory that people in Mongolia that really want to uh, connect that Russian word is hore is ora. There is no consonant at the beginning. So in the linguistic theory, in Mongolian linguistic theory, the, all the mo most of the words started with vowel now. In the ancient Mongolian, proto-Mongolian language, there were P. For example, Otong is like is Potong. Then P became F, Potong. Then another F became H, Hotong. And then usually this H sound 
disappears. So, hore, the he sound disappearing and becoming ora is linguistically possible. You can't, we can't really say it's exact, but it's linguistically possible. But same hore in H in, in, in uh, English speaking or in Western languages. We can connect, we can just say it's interesting and possible, and even the American founding fathers talked about like this, but uh, this kind of etymology and the connection is very difficult to prove, and then it's the, it's the, at the end. <laughs> Just think, uh, reading the money, they make the tunjur. 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 Ah, money. Tunjur. He need to Tunjur. Tunjur. Ah. Tunjur. 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 Би сайн шатахгүй тунжуур гэж тийм байна. Тэрийг бас сонирхоор тунжуур хийн гэж. За ингээ бас цохоолоогоо цохиод ингээд болох. Тийм байна. 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 So the question was, is the Ortindo long song could be connected with the Tunjur? And we, all three of us, never heard about Tunjur. Tunjur, and he explains that when uh, monks uh, repeat their uh, sutras, uh, chanting, they do Tunjur. So he can show what is Tunjur in Lamas. And he, that was, he was previously a Lama himself. Many Tunjur in Jarraskin Zurgun Ternik. I don't wish to have a lot of people who are not going to be able to do this. I don't know if you're going to be able to do this. I don't know
So uh, Mr. Raporti said just uh, only the vowel weaving is there and that could be really common ground with the long song. Um, in long song there is also a religious long song um, called Guru Do. Um, other uh, researcher actually has been published the, the book in Ulaanbaatar and also Shashitrudo, something like that, that is related to uh, religious uh, contents. But for this one, Mr. Rapport said, um, it's only the vowel weaving is kind of looks like uh, the characteristic of the Urchindo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and performance. So I never seen in like this presentation in my life <laughs> before. So <laughs> linguistically, musically, and so the, the it's, it's, it was wonderful. So I just was uh, interesting about the origin of the gingo. So the gingo, when maybe will be, uh, would be, you know, did it start the gingo? So if you research about gingo, so can you tell about a little bit about the origin of Gingo? In my opinion, and but also in my opinion, the, the gingo was originated at the same time that uh, the horse culture, at the same time that the uh, Mongolians started to uh, uh, domesticate uh, horses. The Guri Guri song, that uh, Guri Guri kind of melody was uh, the calling, calling to yourself the, this, uh, the horses. And then this gingo one is the kind of opposite. Have, they make the horse run, the gallop fastly. They saw the kids uh, uh, sing that song and then make the horses uh, faster gallop. For Sarah Lerton, doctor, so can you explain about the origin of the word gingo? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a gingo and then the, the different uh, way of the zingo. Was, right? So two different versions, Gingo and Zengo. It's a very difficult uh, to, uh, etymologically, it's very difficult to say. It's, it's only one thing that we can say. It's, it's a interjection. Interjections are like different. It's a, interjections are those kind of words that when, from your soul, right? From your soul. When you're very happy, you shout something. When you're, when you're riding a horse and then in order to make it, like, make it go like chew, right? Chew. So it's a, what is chen, what is u? It's etymologically, it's very difficult to uh, explain. But one thing is very clear. Those interjections in linguistically always is the, originated in the very early period of the language. It's like as a kids when they start to talk, all the first is emotional words. The same thing in the Gingo and the Gingo. And another one, just a small note. If you don't know the etymology of the word, that means that's very early. If it's the, the, the modern one, we can very really say so. Uh, thank you for a very illuminating keynote presentation. Learned a lot. And uh, being raised as a Mongolian, of course, very proud of this uh, long song culture. And uh, happy to learn that uh, UNESCO has registered it as a global heritage. So I have two questions. One is the, uh, so um, what is the state of uh, uh, research and studies of the long song in the world? So it doesn't have a global appeal. And I know you are an amazing musicologist, and thank you for championing and studying uh, the long singing in Mongolia. Um, are there any uh, other researchers who are also studying? But uh, my question is, um, you know, I consider it a classical art on par with opera singing, on par with all the other classical forms of art, you know, ballet and so forth. So is there a global appeal? Are there any other people um, just outside of Mongolia who want to learn uh, long song? The art of long song is my first question. 
And the second question is more like, in my discussions with friends, people talk about how a singer can reach multiple octaves, right? And then as demonstrated by Mr. Batbolt, he you know, reached something that I could never imagine, a male voice reaching. So uh, a typical male and female long song singers, how many octaves do they cover and what is the highest number of octaves known to be covered by a long song singer? Um, I think that, that was, can be answered, the first one can be answered by me, maybe the second one um, can be answered by uh, Mr. Robert here. So um, somehow it is very appealing genre and a lot of people when they listen to the long song, um, they want to study and go to Mongolia and start and never finish. Somehow it's a very hard genre, somehow I destined to study long song, and so I spent a lot of time outside, uh, countryside with the holders and singers. That's why I started understanding. It, it, takes, it takes really a lot of time to understand what it is. So um, I know some of the researcher doing in Inner Mongolia a lot, um, and some in, in English, uh, scholarship, um, we had a cattle pack in England who not mainly focused on long song, but did a lot of uh, um, Mongolian music, but had a lot of research on long song as well. And other than that, now a lot of younger generation started looking into it. And um, some of the Mongolian descendant um, studying outside of um, Mongolia started looking into it, and that I know. But it has been, even for the Mongolians, for younger generations, I think I, they're more interested in hip hop than long song. <laughs> so, and to understand long song, and it's not just you go in and understand the techniques. You have to go in, and really you have to see how they sing in the context. So, maybe because the the difficulty of the researcher, it hasn't been really. Um, out a lot. So that is the situation predicament of long song research scholarship right now. Um, the second one was about the range of the uh, vocal singers. So, and that wide range is one of the characteristic of the, this long song. And recently, I think, right. So um, usually like uh, two octaves and um, the male singer goes down really like a lower voice to a little bit higher and woman uh, singers can go from, uh, from here to very high. But another characteristic within that high range that goes up and down really quickly as well. So they have enough breath, they have enough vocal cord that they can do which is really interesting. But recently, one of the famous long song singers, Chimetsu, um, sung three octaves by the actually long song that was composed by Jan So um, the composer, uh, Jan Sinurup, uh, Mr. Jan Sinurup actually made that three octaves and she just made it. So that's the, what I know. But thank you. Thank you so much. We'll have time to um, chat further when we're looking at the display uh, in the Asian Reading Room. Um, but first, I have a very short um, introduction to the Mongolian collection here. Uh, many of you are already familiar with the collection, um, so I will um, I'll just offer a few slides to introduce it to you, and then we'll be going over to the Asian Reading Room to see the display itself. Our current Mongolian acquisitions began in 1992, uh, but the first Mongolian books came to the Library of Congress in the uh, 1890s. They were gifts from American diplomat William Rockhill, and this is actually the first Mongolian book to arrive at the Library of Congress, the Sutra of the Great Liberation. It's a very beautiful illustrated manuscript. Uh, our total statistics are about 17,000 items, uh, which includes 12,000 monographs, many serial titles, microfiche, etc. And books about Mongolia are in the general collections or in one of these special collections. For example, 
books about uh, Mongolian music are in the recorded sound division <coughs> primarily, and CDs, media are also kept there. So uh, this year um, I prepared and so Will helped me with a display in the Asian reading room. Uh, this is uh, the title we selected, I selected uh, Songs of the Steps, and you'll see uh, many uh, books in the uh, display on long song, uh, other musical traditions, uh, art, culture, and archaeology. And I included uh, one rare book. Uh, it is the um, 18th century xylograph biography of Milarepa, uh, who's uh, is an 11th century Tibetan yogi, whose songs are uh, actually uh, part of Mongolian Buddhist plays and um, I believe are sung in, in rituals, Buddhist mis rituals in Mongolia. So we will be going to the Asian reading room to see the display, but first uh, enjoy some refreshments. We should leave the room around um, four o'clock. We can meet at the back door and uh, I'll help you walk over to the Asian reading room if you don't know where it is. Thank you very much.